Welcome to conference coverage highlights presented by ReachMD on XM160 and powered by Health Day. Conference coverage highlights features the latest clinical information and research findings from the Radiological Society of North America's 95th Scientific Assembly and annual meeting. The meeting took place November 29th to December 4th in Chicago. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Kina. And I'm Sue Berg. Research was presented at the meeting with over 100 scientific sessions, 250 abstract presentations, and numerous workshops and technical exhibits. This year's meeting attracted more than 57,000 attendees from around the world. More than 2,400 scientific presentations and posters covering recent trends in radiological research were featured, along with more than 1,800 educational and informatics exhibits and an expert panel discussion of revised screening mammography guidelines issued by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. The theme for this year was Quality Counts, referring both to the need to track the performance of radiologists and the need to track patient outcomes and monitor the appropriateness of various imaging studies. Dr. Robert M. Quencer, Scientific Program Committee Chair, said that over-ordering of imaging studies is a major concern in radiology and in all corners of health care. Meeting highlights included the Eugene P. Pendergrass New Horizons Lecture, delivered by Graham M. Bitter of the University of California in San Diego. Dr. Bitter's discussion was on the buried information in magnetic resonance scanning. He argued that we're only taking advantage of the subjective portion of magnetic resonance imaging, but in the depths of all that imaging is important information to be extracted that probably will be extracted in the future. Dr. Bitter discussed weighting, which he called the most commonly used technical term in clinical MR. It relates image contrast to differences in tissue properties and furthermore to pathology. However, Dr. Bitter said the term is used as little more than a label in the MR physics literature. According to Dr. Bitter, this lack of quantitative definition is a barrier to understanding and implementing quantitative studies on signal and contrast. Dr. Bitter is a pioneer and expert on MR techniques, clinical applications, and image interpretation. He's a professor of radiology at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Bitter previously spent more than 20 years with the Department of Diagnostic Radiology in the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at Hammersmith Hospital at the University of London. Other highlights included an expert panel critical of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. In November, the task force advised against routine mammography in women under 50 and over 75 years of age and recommended screening women aged 50 to 74 only every other year. The panel criticized the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and voiced support for the American Cancer Society guidelines. The American Cancer Society recommends annual mammograms for all women 40 years of age and older. Dr. Daniel Copans, who directs breast imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, said that deaths from breast cancer have dropped by 30% since 1990, the year mammography screening beginning at age 40 became more widespread. Dr. Copan said that the current American Cancer Society guidelines have been shown to save lives and that U.S. Preventive Services, by its own admission, said women's lives will be lost under the new guidelines. Dr. Copans commented that this does not seem to be much of a choice for women. Another panelist, Dr. Stephen A. Feig, director of breast imaging at the University of California at Irvine Breast Health Center, argues that the net effect of the new guidelines is that screening would begin too late and its effects would be too little. He concluded that money would be saved, but lives would be lost. Multiple studies presented at the meeting showed the benefits of enhanced imaging in subgroups of women at high risk for breast cancer. One study was a retrospective review of 830 women under the age of 30 with focal breast signs or symptoms. The women underwent over 1,100 targeted ultrasound examinations and three malignancies were detected. The authors reported that all cancers were detected with ultrasound, suggesting that mammography may not be indicated in this setting. Furthermore, the cancer yield from biopsy was found to only be 1.8%. The authors say, therefore, close ultrasound surveillance may be a preferred alternative to tissue sampling in this patient population. Two authors of the study reported financial relationships with a general electric company. Other new research suggested that high-frequency ultrasound with elastography can accurately distinguish skin cancers from benign skin conditions. 
The study involved 40 patients with malignant tumors and non-malignant skin conditions. One of the study's co-authors said in a statement that dermatologists tend to biopsy any lesions that seem visually suspicious for disease. As a consequence, many benign lesions are needlessly biopsied in order to minimize the risk of missing a potentially deadly melanoma. The researchers found that high-frequency ultrasound accurately characterized the depth and extent of lesions. Further, they found that elastography identified 98% of lesions that had malignant findings on biopsy and 82% of benign lesions. For benign cystic lesions, the elasticity ratio between normal skin and the adjacent skin lesion was 0.04 to 0.03. This was significantly lower compared to the elasticity of malignant lesions, which was greater than 10. These findings suggest that this uninvasive technique could be used to spare patients from receiving needless biopsies. One author of this study reported financial relationships with General Electric Company and other technology companies. Another study showed that magnetic resonance imaging can accurately identify placenta accreta. Placenta accreta occurs when the placenta attaches itself too deeply into the wall of the uterus. It's the leading cause of death for women during childbirth. Risk factors for placenta accreta include placenta previa, uterine scarring, prior cesarean births or pregnancy after the age of 35. Women who have previously had a cesarean section are at three times greater risk for this condition, and the risk escalates with each subsequent cesarean section. Investigators studied 108 women who were referred between 1992 and 2009 for imaging based on a suspicious prenatal ultrasound or clinical examination or because they had significant risk factors for placenta accreta. When correlated with surgical and pathology findings, Researchers found that magnetic resonance imaging had a 90.1% accuracy rate in detecting placenta accreta. The investigators said in a statement that their findings suggest that MRI is an extremely useful adjunct to ultrasound for assessing this potentially life-threatening obstetric condition. They added that having placenta accreta is not necessarily a negative prognostic indicator. When accreta is diagnosed ahead of time, the delivery can be planned accordingly. However, if the condition goes undiagnosed, it can potentially be life-threatening. In women at high risk for breast cancer, adding magnetic resonance imaging after three years of screening with mammography and ultrasound may increase the rate of cancer detection. Researchers studied 627 high-risk women who underwent magnetic resonance imaging within 91 days of their last mammography and ultrasound test. They found that magnetic resonance imaging after mammography and ultrasound was associated with a supplemental yield of 15.1 breast cancer cases per 1,000 women. Two authors of this study reported relationships with General Electric Company and Siemens AG, Koninglijski Philips Electronics NV. A second study suggested that adding mammography to ultrasound in women aged 30 to 39 years with focal breast symptoms or signs may not significantly increase the rate of cancer detection. Investigators studied just over 1,300 cases in over 1,000 women. 91% of the patients were evaluated by ultrasound and mammography. The researchers found that the sensitivity of ultrasound at the area of clinical concern was 100%, and mammography was 64%. Further, they found that mammography detected only one additional malignancy. The study's authors conclude that further investigation is warranted to support continued use of mammography in this patient population. Two authors of this study reported relationships with Johnson & Johnson and or General Electric Company. Research was presented at the meeting suggesting that in the case of pediatric non-traumatic back pain, lumbar disc disease appears prevalent. To be included in the study, patients between the ages of 12 and 20 were retrospectively assessed based on lumbar spine MRI for the presence of lumbar disc disease, multilevel disease, facet joint disease, spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis, and one or more of the following, disc desiccation, disc space narrowing, disc protrusion, or disc bulge. Of the 189 patients who had met the criteria, the researchers found that 50% had lumbar disc disease, 47% had no MRI evidence of lumbar disc disease, and the remaining 3% had non-disc-related abnormalities. When body mass index data was available, MRI evidence of lumbar disc disease was significantly more common in patients with the highest BMI quartile compared to those with the lower body mass index. 
The authors conclude that there is a strong relationship between increased body mass index in the pediatric population and the incidence of lumbar disc disease, and that there's a high incidence of MR abnormalities of the lumbar spine in children who present with back pain. Research was presented at the conference that suggests low-dose radiation from annual mammography may be associated with an increased risk of breast cancer in high-risk women who have genetic or familial dispositions to the disease. Researchers in the Netherlands conducted a meta-analysis of six studies assessing breast cancer risk in high-risk women exposed to low-dose radiation. Four of the studies selected looked at the effect of exposure to low-dose radiation among breast cancer gene mutation carriers. The two other studies looked at the effect of radiation on women with a family history of breast cancer. For all high-risk women in the study, the risk of breast cancer due to low-dose radiation exposure was one and a half times higher compared to high-risk women who were not exposed to low-dose radiation. The results also seem to suggest that women at high risk for breast cancer who were exposed to low-dose radiation before the age of 20 or had five or more exposures were two and a half times more likely to develop breast cancer than high-risk women who were not exposed to low-dose radiation. The authors conclude that while screening is important for women at high risk for breast cancer, a careful approach is warranted when considering mammography for screening young women, particularly women under the age of 30. And for women at high risk for breast cancer, repeated exposure to low-dose radiation should be avoided. Another study presented at the meeting looked at the risks from radiation to patients undergoing abdominal and pelvic computed tomography, or CT, imaging studies. Researchers used the American College of Radiology's appropriateness criteria to review over 970 CT series from 500 patients. Patients ranged in age from 9 months to 91 years. All the CT studies were performed at outside institutions and submitted to the university for interpretation. The authors reported that unindicated series were found in just over half the patient exams, or approximately 35% of all CT series. In addition, the most common unnecessary exam was delayed phase imaging. It accounted for almost 78% of the unnecessary series. The investigators calculated that average excess radiation exposure from unnecessary scans was 11.3 millisieverts, equal to 113 chest x-rays or three years of naturally occurring background radiation. In the abstract for this study, the authors write that they calculate this dose could add up to 20,000 radiation-induced cancer cases annually in the United States. The authors conclude that the practice of adding unindicated non-contrast and delayed series to abdominal and pelvic CT examinations may represent a potential public health danger without any associated clinical benefit. One author of this study reported financial relationships with New Wave Medical Incorporated and Covidian AG. Finally, radiologists may be able to accurately diagnose acute appendicitis remotely with the aid of a handheld device or mobile phone equipped with special software. Researchers assessed the diagnostic accuracy of five radiologists using iPhone G3s equipped with Osiris Mobile's medical image viewing application. The radiologists reviewed computed tomography examinations of the abdomen and pelvis of 25 patients with right lower quadrant pain. The authors found that the radiologists correctly identified the 15 patients with confirmed acute appendicitis with more than 99% accuracy. There was one false negative reading and no false positives. Further, in 88% of interpretations, the radiologists correctly identified calcified deposits. They correctly identified inflammation near the appendix 96% of the time and fluid near the appendix 94% of the time. The authors conclude this technology may be useful for emergent consultations, particularly in academic settings where on-call faculty physicians may not have immediate access to a computer. The OSIRIS-X software has not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for listening to conference coverage highlights from the Radiological Society of North America's 95th Scientific Assembly and Annual Meeting. This meeting took place November 29th through December 4th in Chicago. Conference coverage highlights is a presentation of ReachMD Radio, broadcast on XM160 and by live stream at ReachMD.com and powered by HealthDay.